Hello and welcome everyone. We hope you've had a good week. The past week has been cold, however, above freezing temperatures are forecast for nearly every day next week. So the groundhogs may have been right and spring may be on the way. This means it might be time to get ready for this year's plant gardening season by starting some of your seeds indoors for planting outdoors later in the spring. On behalf of the Maryville Fallowfield Pastoral Charge, greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Today, on this third Sunday in Lent, we come joining our hearts together, ready to learn about the life and teachings of Jesus. I understand from our council meeting this week that we sometimes have non-member visitors joining our online service, and we want to provide a big Maryville Fallowfield welcome to them. We continue to be ever so grateful to all who bring our online services to you every week. So a big thank you goes out to everyone involved. How fortunate we are to have such amazing and talented team. We want to especially thank Barb Fraser and Eileen Malcolm for their beautiful music. Their voices are a valuable addition to our worship service. Our charge will be offering online services for Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, as well as on Easter Sunday. Details will be available at a later date. We hope you will continue to take this sacred journey with us through Lent and Holy Week. Holy Communion will be celebrated on Palm Sunday, as well as on Monday, Thursday. Even though we are gathering and worshiping online, we are still committed to helping the many charitable organizations that desperately need our donations at this time of the year. The Elizabeth Fry Society, Center 507, the Ottawa Mission, and the local food banks are just a few that need our, your generosity during these difficult times. You can find a list of these community places on our website. If you would like to make a donation to the church, you can do so online by e-transfer to muchurch at bellnet.ca, or you can send a check to either Maryville Church or Fallowfield Church. You can find the address for each church on our website, which is www.maryvillefallowfield.org. We thank everyone for their continued contributions to our churches and support of those in need. These are all the announcements for this week. We hope that you will now sit back, relax, and enjoy worshiping with us on this third Sunday of our Lenten journey. Until next time, have a wonderful week, stay safe, keep well. Hello again. Grace and I are here from snowy Casey Cape, New Brunswick to be with you for the third Sunday in Lent. The lighting of the Christ candle. Today, as we light the Christ candle, we ask God to open our hearts so that we may become a holy people to fill our hearts with burning questions about our faith and to increase our capacity for compassion and mercy. Come, let us worship our God.
to please join me in prayer. Holy God, we come to worship in the gathering shadows of our Lenten journey. We come as friends reflecting on your hope for all creation. Today on this third Sunday in Lent, we ask that you bless us with hearts of flesh. Oh God, we are grateful for the foundation the apostles and prophets built our faith tradition upon. And so we pray that you will rekindle in us the spirit of their integrity and unity so that we might continue their noble gospel work. Pour out your love, O oh Lord, on all who seek to be faithful disciples, that we may proclaim your true and life-giving word. As we continue our walk with Jesus during this holy season, keep us genuine to your call upon our lives and keep us steadfast in our journey. God, we ask that in our words and in our actions we may be more like Jesus so that we may always hallow your name. And we pray this through Jesus who taught us to say, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, ch verses 1 to 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. 
For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Gospel reading is from John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. The time of Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my God's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The people then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, 
destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The people then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be aligned with your love, O oh God. Amen. The Jesus in our story this morning from the Gospel of John is not the Jesus we learned about in Sunday school or the fairest Lord Jesus we sing about. On days when we open our service with the hymn, Come and Find a Quiet Center, we would never expect to hear about a Jesus that has, let's face it, basically lost his mind and gone completely out of control. But today, today we encounter the Jesus we don't often talk about. And let's face it, we are not going to joyfully sing loudly about a Jesus who chases people with whips, overturns tables, and throws coins at people as they run frantically from a building. So who, just who is this Jesus in our story today? Well, for me, this is a Jesus who is displaying unimaginable courage. Jesus' undying love and compassion for humanity is found in this single act of radical rebellion against those who oppress the most vulnerable of society. Jesus is displaying superhero courage when he takes on the authorities who have turned the temple into a money-making machine. And this moment in Jesus' life, more than any other moment, reveals and clarifies his mission, his theology, his politics, his relationship to religious authorities, and more importantly, his disdain toward Roman occupation. What we must remember about our story today is that it actually took place the day after Jesus entered Jerusalem for Passover. And although his entrance into Jerusalem was dramatic and meant to provoke the authorities, nothing compared to what Jesus did in the temple. Try and picture it if you can. Jesus was not alone when he raged in the temple. His disciples, and I would imagine the crowds that had cheered him on the day before, would have been marching right behind him. When Jesus went through the temple like a whirlwind, he knew full well that he would be facing a daunting and frightening future. And the Romans knew his name and they had his number. They may not have known any of the names of the people in the crowd, but they certainly knew the name Jesus. And they were fully aware of what this radical messianic man was up to. And they were none too pleased. Author Ressa Aslan in his book, Zealot, says, Jesus and his disciples have just taken part in what the Roman authorities would have deemed a capital offense. Sedition punishable by crucifixion. After all, an attack on the business of the temple is akin to an attack on the priestly nobility, which, considering the temple's tangled relationship with Rome, 
is tantamount to an attack on Rome itself. You see, Rome got the profits from the temple authorities by oppressing the poor and the foreigners. And in our story, our story today, this is the Jesus whose powerful character has emerged from a lifetime of facing fears and shouldering people's burdens. He was displaying courage that had been forged by accepting challenges and responsibilities that most of us would avoid. And he was determined to keep on the path that he believed God had chosen for him. Jesus would continue to travel the path challenging those in authority, knowing it would cost him his life. Jesus' temple rage was a clear statement on where he exactly fell in the debate over God's sovereignty and God's will for the common people. There is no doubt that Jesus' words and actions at the temple precipitated his arrest and execution. He knew it would. And yet he was committed and ready to embark on this dark and difficult destiny for the sake of humanity. How can we not admire the steadfast courage that Jesus displayed in moving forward to Jerusalem and the cross on behalf of the world that he loved so much? Jesus purposely made himself vulnerable for the sake of others. He showed us that taking a stand for the sake of others is what stands at the heart of Christian life. We will never have to face what Jesus did, but we still must commit ourselves to always taking a stand for the sake of others. Jesus invites us to discover the strength of being open to the needs of those around us. This story that has Jesus threatening Rome's occupation of Palestine and the power of the authorities over the common people should influence everything we read in the Gospels about Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus' actions in Jerusalem were done out of the profound love he had for the people around him. The story of Jesus clearing the temple calls us to be more authentically human and more caring compassionate and courageous in our own lives. I think I have mentioned to my congregation before that courage comes from the Latin core, heart, which defines courage as living from the heart, the willingness to be our authentic selves, to embrace all of our personality, not just the pretty side. If something is going on in the world that enrages us, that is good because that emotion is part of us and that emotion can spur us to action. Jesus lived from the heart and that made him challenge anything and everything that was not beneficial for humanity and God's creation. Jesus fully embraced who God called him to be for the sake of those he loved. May we be blessed with the compassion of Jesus. May we be blessed with the love of Jesus. And may we also be blessed with the rage of Jesus. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we have come together with our dreams, our dreams of wholeness for all of creation. We come with Moses, Sarah, Abraham, the prophets, and the disciples, ready to walk this Lenten journey that calls us to build your kingdom come on earth. We meet Jesus on this journey, knowing that he is traveling to the cross, ready to give himself for us. In the valleys and on the mountain tops on this journey, you are sharing in our dream, calling to us and reminding us that we are not alone. You call us to turn our dreams into a reality. And so we pray that you will help us to remember that we are your beloved children, people who are ready to witness peacefully to the heart of our faith. In a world where so many people are hurting, help us to be people of peace, justice, and love. Today, oh God, we continue to pray for the leaders of the world and their work regarding COVID-19. We are grateful for all who have worked so hard to produce vaccines that will help not only us, but the whole world. And we know that we dearly miss being together, seeing each other face to face, but we have faith in science and faith in you. And we trust that the end of our isolation is coming. And now, oh God, we just take a moment to offer our hearts up to you in a moment of silence. Gracious God, may we always be thankful for the light that shines in the darkness. Amen. Go into the world as faithful disciples of Jesus. And may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God's countenance be upon you and give you peace. Amen.